Welcome to the Cato Institute. My name is Ilya Shapiro. I'm the director of the Robert, Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies. And I'm delighted to uh, have this uh, book forum for Keith Whittington's Repugnant Laws, Judicial Review of Acts of Congress from the Founding to the Present. Repugnant Laws provides a political history of how the Supreme Court has exercised the power of judicial review. I'll put it here. Um, from the adoption of the Constitution to the present, the book draws on a first-of-its-kind comprehensive inventory of every case in which the court has substantively reviewed the constitutionality of a provision of federal law and either upheld the application of the statute or refused to apply it due to a constitutional limit on congressional authority. It makes use of the publicly available Judicial Review of Congress database, which I hadn't heard of until I saw this book, actually. Uh, to re-examine how aggressively the court has enforced limits on congressional power over time. It also reevaluates the political relationship between the court and the elected branches of government and revises our understanding of the history of constitutional law. As battles over the future of the Supreme Court heat up, we have quite the panel to discuss the limits of judicial power and the ways in which the court reflects the politics of its time. I'll introduce uh, each of the panelists uh, in turn briefly, and then they will get up and, and make their presentations. Uh, Keith Whittington is William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Politics in the Department of Politics at Princeton, my alma mater, although I don't think we overlapped. I think you arrived just after I graduated. Uh, in addition to repugnant laws, he's the author of the award-winning Speak Freely, Why Universities Must Defend uh, free speech, and two other books. He's currently completing Constitutional Crises, Real and Imagined, and The Idea of Democracy in America, From the American Revolution to the Gilded Age. Uh, so he, very narrow topics with no, no appeal, really. Uh, uh, no deep thinking required at all. Uh, Keith's work for a general audience has appeared in a variety of places, including the Volokh Conspiracy, where he blogs regularly. He received two undergraduate degrees from the University of Texas and two graduate degrees from Yale. Greg Ivers is professor of government in the School of Public Affairs at American University. He's the author or editor of several books, including To Build a Wall, American Jews, and the Separation of Church and State, Creating Constitutional Change, and Inside the Judicial Process, and numerous articles on constitutional law, civil rights and liberties, law and popular culture, the civil rights movements, and other topics that meet at the intersection of law, politics, and society. And as, as I was cobbling together uh, quite this, uh, you know, boiling down this impressive bio, I noticed that uh, uh, Greg and I have a, a big dispute, apparently, over the utility of the Oxford comma. I don't know if we're going to get into that, but there's, there's many uh, list, list sequences in your bio, and they're, they're all missing the, uh, the clarity that the Oxford comma would present. <laughs> um, Professor Ivers' latest book is Constitutional Law and Introduction, which is the first book in the field of public law designed exclusively for online learners. I guess you're now going to be competing for uh, sales with Josh Blackman and Randy Barnett, so better watch out for that. Um, he's currently writing Swingin' at Jim Crow, How Jazz Became a Civil Rights Movement. So we have quite the polymath here. Professor Ivers did his undergrad work at University of Missouri and his graduate work at Emory University. Uh, and finally, David Bernstein is the George Mason University Foundation Professor at the Antonin Scalia Law School, where he's been teaching since 1995. And David, you might have forgotten this, but I was actually, when you were a very junior baby professor, I was uh, offered the opportunity to be your research assistant one summer, and I turned that down. So I don't know whether that uh, benefited uh, or hurt either of us, uh, but, but anyway. Neil Mont, which I okay for. <laughs> Who did? Neil Mont from Lehman American Oh, okay. School. Okay. Good, good, good. Uh, I went to a think tank instead, so here I am rather than being in academia. <laughs> Uh, he's also been a visiting professor at Brooklyn Law School, Georgetown, uh, Michigan, and William and Mary. He's, co uh, he's written or co-authored several books, including Lawless, The Obama Administration's Unprecedented Assault on the Constitution and the Rule of Law, and A Conspiracy Against Obamacare, The Volokh Conspiracy and the Healthcare Case. So also a conspiracy to the Volokh, also a contributor to the Volokh Conspiracy blog, and an adjunct scholar at Cato, and uh, David is a graduate of Brandeis University and Yale Law School. So without further ado, Keith, please. So thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk about um, this book, uh, which um, has taken up uh, far more of my life than I uh, had anticipated. 
uh, when I initially started. Um, like many projects, if you sort of knew how much work it was going to take uh, when you started off, you might not have done it um, in the first place. Um, but I hope the product is ultimately um, worth it. Um, both the book itself, um, which um, I hope is uh, valuable and tries to provide um, an analysis of the politics and law um, uh, surrounding um, how the court has exercised judicial review uh, relative to congressional statutes over time, um, but also now the publicly available um, data set, uh, which you can find on my website, and as well as not only the data set itself, which um, provides uh, the catalog of all these cases in which I think the court has um, either uh, struck down uh, laws as being uh, invalid and contrary to uh, the Constitution um, or upheld them against constitutional challenge, um, uh, as well as a set of variables associated with that, as, as well as descriptions of how that uh, data set was constructed um, and how the variables uh, were coded in general. Um, I should note that the book is not ultimately a, a general um, history of constitutional law, not even constitutional law as articulated by the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, it doesn't deal with how the U.S. Supreme Court has evaluated um, the work of the states over time, and that's a significant component um, of what the U.S. Supreme Court has done across American history, is evaluate um, state laws. It also doesn't focus attention on the executive branch and judicial branch and ways in which they might have violated um, the Constitution through their own uh, particular activities. Instead, it's focused on uh, limits on federal legislative power. What are the constitutional constraints on Congress? Congress itself, whether those constitutional constraints become obvious um, through the actions of the president or executive agents or through um, various others, but the focus is on what the rules are um, that constrain uh, congressional power um, over time. And I hope the book makes a contribution both in our understanding of the history surrounding um, judicial review and how the U.S. Supreme Court um, has related to Congress over time, but also the politics um, surrounding um, judicial review. Um, I think it's from a historical perspective, um, the first thing I hope the book accomplishes is there's a lot more um, effort by the court to evaluate um, congressional statutes um, than we tend to give credit for. Um, ultimately, I think there have been over 1,300 cases in which the court um, has seriously evaluated um, the application of a federal statute um, in a case uh, in front of them, a quarter of those leading to some kind of invalidation or refusal um, to apply the statute and the case um, at hand, um, and uh, roughly three quarters of them resulting in the court upholding um, those congressional statutes. Um, that's a lot more cases than we tend to um, take into account when we're thinking about the history of judicial review. Um, certainly we tend to, I think, ignore all the cases in which the court tends to uphold um, acts of Congress against constitutional challenge. Um, those are less politically exciting. They may seem less consequential. Um, but I think actually there's been an important aspect of how the court has exercised power of judicial review over time, has built up the powers of Congress over time, and also built up its own power um, as a court capable um, of articulating um, limits and hearing constitutional challenges um, to Congress um, on the whole. Um, it's also true, I think, the distribution of those cases um, uh, might be uh, surprising. So, for example, um, there are far more uh, instances in which the court was evaluating acts of Congress um, in the early American history than we tend to give credit for. Um, our core um, approach to thinking about um, uh, the American Constitution and how the court exercises this review um, between the founding era and the Civil War uh, tends to emphasize that the court has only struck down statutes um, twice uh, during that period in uh, Marbury versus Madison, early in the Jefferson administration, um, and then Dred Scott just before um, the Civil War. I think that significantly underestimates how often the court uh, was called upon to enforce limits um, on congressional power. Um, sometimes during that early period, the court was in fact upholding um, uh, acts that Congress had taken. Um, but in many instances, the court, in fact, was imposing limitations um, on congressional power uh, during that early period. And it's through that effort to enforce constitutional limits um, on Congress that was building up the practice of judicial review and encouraging more litigants to come to the federal courts um, to ask for their protection uh, from abusive government officials, including abusive legislatures um, who exceeded their power uh, more generally. I also think that these um, cases um, ultimately are much more varied than we tend to give credit for. We tend to pay attention to um, the cases that seem most historically significant, they're most politically consequential, and often that means politically con uh, 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 controversial um, at the time. But a great deal of what the court um, does, including instances when it's actually striking down statutes, um, are not necessarily politically controversial and often involve policies that are not um, all that salient to political actors more generally. One of the reasons why a great 
great deal of judicial review um, flies below the, our historical radar um, is precisely because at the time uh, they were not nearly as controversial and contested and didn't create the kind of uproar um, that we uh, tend to focus our attention on um, even when we're thinking about this historically. It also reflects the fact that I think the court itself has sometimes um, tried to obscure um, what it has done. Uh, through much of the 19th century, the court uh, tended to follow, I think, the approach that um, Justice Joseph Story um, emphasized when he was writing circuit and then uh, asked to uh, rule on a case um, involving a constitutional challenge to Congress. Um, and in that case, he emphasized, um, in his opinion, that um, uh, judges should generally not presume that Congress meant to violate the Constitution, um, they should do all that they can to read statutes um, so as to make them consistent uh, with constitutional requirements. He did not suggest that meant, therefore, that judges should be deferential um, to what Congress has done. He did not suggest um, that means that courts should, therefore, avoid um, having to resolve constitutional questions. Um, instead, it was a question about how he went about the task and how courts in general went about the task of trying to enforce um, constitutional limits on Congress, which often required um, being clear about what those limits are, articulating and pronouncing and um, uh, uh, um, emphasizing um, those limits on congressional power, um, but then trying to uh, resolve the cases in front of them in ways um, that prevents Congress um, and government officials who are acting on behalf of Congress from enforcing um, those legal requirements in a way that uh, conflicts with the Constitution um, to uh, the parties um, in front of them. That also means what the court has done over time is try to limit how um, statutes should be applied in particular cases. And they ultimately are constraining what Congress does and limiting the scope of statutes uh, through that effort of focusing on how does the statute apply in this particular case, rather than simply declaring that statutes on the whole um, are null and void um, in their entirety. Um, the court certainly does that on occasion, but it's far more often leveraging the power of judicial review um, and in order to enforce constitutional limits um, in the particular cases um, in front of it. It's also true across the court's history, there's been a fair amount of variation in what kinds of issues the court has focused on, both in terms of the kind of policies that Congress is bringing before them, but also the kinds of values and ideas that justices themselves care about, and as a consequence, the kinds of constitutional rules um, that they want to enforce over time. So through much of the 19th century, the court is particularly focused on thinking about structural issues, particularly uh, federalism-based limitations on congressional power, um, often focused on economic rights of various sorts and economic limitations um, built in into congressional power, including limits on the Congress's uh, taxation power, uh, for example. Over the course of the 20th century, the court has increasingly focused less on those kinds of issues and more and more um, on personal liberties of various um, sorts. Um, so there's been an explosion of cases focusing on uh, the individual rights um, of, in, of uh, particular parties that come before the court um, and a relative decline of how often the court is focused on these other aspects of the Constitution that if you were to look at constitutional law in the 19th century, you would have thought the Constitution was mostly about things other than uh, the personal liberties of individuals given what the court Court, um, said about it. And finally, I should note um, something about the political um, focus of the book. So the book is not only trying to um, unpack what the history of the court has been and how it has exercised its power of judicial review over time, but trying to put it in a political context to try to think about how the court relates to um, other branches of government, in particular um, Congress, um, how the kinds of policies that are being struck down and evaluated by the court um, fit into the politics um, of the period. And part of the focus of that uh, approach and thinking about it in this context is to emphasize the extent to which the court and the justices fit within a broader governing coalition, that they are part of the political process. Um, they don't stand apart from it. And by that, I don't mean to suggest that judges are simply toadies of political actors, that they're simply doing uh, whatever it is the politicians want them to do, um, that they are simply um, partisan hacks um, on the bench um, acting in the same way uh, that members of Congress uh, would prefer that they do um, uh, from the legislative side. But they do tend to share the ideals, the values, the perspectives, the interests um, that are reflected in a broader governing coalition um, that won elections and ultimately um, brought uh, legislators to power, um, but also placed those justices on the bench um, in, the first, uh, in the first place. And sometimes that means that the justices tend to share the kind of nationalistic out, um, outlook um, that is influential on the court and so part of what the court has been doing across its history is upholding federal laws against the kinds of challenges um, that those who would want to see a more decentralized um, political system would want to emphasize, upholding federal laws against um, the uh, pushback uh, from the states in ways that national politicians uh, tended to prefer, even if uh, state and local politicians did not. 
Um, sometimes that's a more ideological output, outlook uh, where the justices um, share a, a controversial view about a set of values and interests that they see uh, reflected in the Constitution. And sometimes that means enforcing that view even against their co-partisans um, in the other branches of government. And sometimes it's a more legalistic approach where the justices value um, procedures and rights in ways that uh, uh, elected politicians um, often don't, uh, where legislators are pushing uh, through some of the details of what the constitutional requirements might be and some of the strictures of particular constitutional rules in order to accomplish some larger policy objective, the justices are often concerned with pushing back um, and re-emphasizing um, legal protections um, that are ultimately important. This is meant, despite the fact the court is, I think, aligned often with dominant coalitions that also influence what the executive branch is doing, what the legislative branch is doing, that the court is not passive on the whole. That doesn't simply mean that the court is getting out of the way um, of what um, other politicians uh, want to accomplish, but instead the judges see their own role as sometimes meaning in order to advance the interests and ideals and values um, of the coalition um, that brought them to power and put them on the bench in the first place, sometimes that means you have to strike down laws, including striking down laws um, of those that uh, would seem to be your friends in Congress. Um, simply because you have Republican judges on the bench does not mean uh, the Republicans should should be able to expect um, that their laws are always going to be upheld or their actions are always going to be upheld. Those justices are going to have their own views and opinions about what the Constitution requires um, and as a consequence will sometimes push back and not only against the uh, policies that are being advanced um, by the other political party, um, but also uh, by uh, their allies um, in the uh, political arena more generally. And finally, I would simply note that um, it's that the part of what this history uh, tries to contribute to is our understanding and appreciation of the extent to which judicial independence is ultimately bounded um, by um, political constraints. The, the judges exercise a lot of autonomy and independence within a certain sphere um, in order to push back on politicians, but there's also boundaries as to how far they can push back um, on politicians. One thing that's allowed the court to exercise judicial review um, freely across its history um, is the fact that it very rarely um, gets in the way of the most um, uh, committed and important policies um, that politicians are trying to accomplish. When there's a strong majority behind um, crucial policies, the courts often either get out of the way or find themselves having to retreat um, in the face of those majorities over time, um, that they have achieved a great deal of independence and strength by nibbling on the margins of policy rather than taking Congress on um, head on. So I think we ultimately can understand the politics and law that develops around the court um, better. Um, if we focus our attention on that broad history, how, Cong how the court has uh, reacted and responded to Congress, um, uh, not just over a few years um, recently, not just in a set of high profile cases um, that we think are, are particularly important or particularly memorable, but across the long stretch of American history and across the wide range um, of cases um, that the court actually has resolved. Thank you. Well, Keith's book is a wonderful achievement. It's going to serve as a resource for serious and I suppose also not so serious constitutional scholars for decades to come. And I just thought uh, in my time here I would highlight a few things I either learned from the book or things the book made me think about more deeply perhaps than I had before. So first, Keith already mentioned this, this whole issue of how often the Supreme Court was engaging in judicial review uh, of congressional actions and what the outcome was between uh, the founding and the Civil War. The conventional wisdom is there are only two cases, Marbury versus Madison and Dred Scott v. Sanford, where the Supreme Court actually either invalidated or limited uh, the Congress congressional statutes based on constitutional considerations. And Keith, of course, found that this wasn't true. Uh, this wasn't quite a shock to me because the conventional wisdom was also that the Supreme Court had never undertaken a substantive interpretation of the Due Process Clause until uh, Scott v. Sanford, a Dred Scott case. When I was researching my own book, Rehabilitating Lochner, which, by the way, Cato helped sponsor, uh, I did a, exactly a two-minute search on the Supreme Court database on Westlaw and discovered a case from several years before uh, Scott v. Sanford where the Supreme Court uh, had uh, adopted a substantive interpretation of the Due Process Clause, and apparently no one had bothered to look. So it's kind of extraordinary that this was conventional wisdom for so long, 
uh, and no one had bothered uh, to look. Uh, but Keith didn't just look and discover the conventional wisdom was wrong and thought there's another case or another two cases or another dozen cases. He found something like 100 cases where the Supreme Court had, had uh, reviewed congressional legislation for its constitutionality. And I think it was 32 in which the court either invalidated what Congress was doing or at least limited them on constitutional grounds. Uh, this says something and something not pretty about the state of American constitutional history, that something could be conventional wisdom, uh, something I've repeated myself to my students because it's conventional wisdom, and uh, has been conventional wisdom for decades, and not a single scholar who's interested in this subject actually bothered to see if it were true. Uh, I've gotten to the point in my own research where I basically don't believe anything anyone says, conventional wisdom or not, about American constitutional history, unless I go back and read the sources myself. A lot of the conventional wisdom about the Supreme Court arose during the progressive era when the progressives were uh, trying to limit the court's authority and say nasty things about the court, and it amounted really to propaganda without much scholarly basis. And we've just accepted these myths as historically true, and uh, we, we, we need not to. Keith, by the way, also does an excellent job of eviscerating the myth that the Supreme Court invented the doctrine of judicial review in Marbury versus Madison. He does a very thorough job of showing that the concept of judicial review was well accepted and uh, well articulated before Marbury. Um, that is a little bit less original because other people have said the same, but I think the job that Keith does in reviewing that history is uh, especially thorough. Another thing that Keith already mentioned that I'd like to highlight is the idea that as a national political institution, the Supreme Court and federal courts in general for that matter tend to be strongly nationalist in orientation, certainly over uh, time. The way political scientists like to put it, the Supreme Court has been much more of an ally than an impediment to the American state building project. Indeed, once they're appointed to federal courts, judges, lawyers tend to be much more sympathetic to federal interests, however conceived, than they might have been otherwise. This is beyond the scope of Keith's book. But in my own research, I found, for example, in the 19th century, there was a wave of anti-Chinese legislation in the American West. And you take judges with very similar biographies, uh, and some wind up on state courts in California, Oregon, and Washington, some wind up in federal courts, and the federal judges are much more likely to challenge the state legislation based on either the federal constitution or our treaty obligations to China than the state court judges with, who seem to share their same prior backgrounds wind up doing. Other researchers have found the same phenomenon with regard to desegregation uh, litigation in the 1950s and 60s. State court judges were tended to uphold uh, whatever the local governments were doing, and federal court judges with similar backgrounds tended to invalidate them as violating Brown versus Board of Education. So there's something about being a federal judge on the Supreme Court otherwise that uh, leads you to think that you are responsible for federal interests. This is not the sort of thing that political scientists in general have taken into account as much because it's in the their models of how uh, judges behave. But I think Keith is actually quite good at understanding the limitations of the crude models that just say that judges are just trying to uh, fulfill whatever political uh, coalitions want them to do and understand that judges also uh, are human beings that uh, have cultural and other influences on them, including the influence of feeling that they are part of a federal system, national system. Political scientists uh, like to point out that the Supreme Court is a political institution subject to uh, general institutional, political, ideological restraints of their times, and Keith mentioned that in his talk. And one, one lesson of that is that one cannot and should not expect the Supreme Court to diverge significantly from popular opinion, and especially from the elite opinion of the places that Supreme Court justices are drawn from. And you could add that the court has no enforcement power of its own. It has no army, has just a few federal marshals. The only way the court's decisions get enforced is because they have the respect of the public and the other political branches. And as a result, as an institution, the Supreme Court is not inclined to step on too many toes. There's also the issue of the biographies of the, and personalities of the justices themselves. In the old days, back to, through like the 19, 50s, let's say, maybe 60s, justices were typically drawn from political allies and cronies of the president. These are not people who one would generally expect to be radically hostile to the political currents of the time, nor to be profiles in courage. 
Today, the typical route to becoming a Supreme Court justice is you're a young, ambitious lawyer who went to Harvard and Yale, and all the justices went to Harvard or Yale, that's why I say that, uh, and you uh, go to Washington, you serve in high levels of, of the administration of your party, OLC or elsewhere, and you impress people and you get put on, you get put on the lower courts and on the short list for the Supreme Court. Now imagine you have two young, ambitious lawyers working at OLC, and there's a controversial issue. The president really wants to do something uh, and you're the OLC lawyer, you say, well, this is ridiculous. The president can't possibly do this under Supreme Court precedent or prior OLC precedent. And you have two options. You could be the guy who says, well, let's just finesse the opinion a little bit and get to let the president do what he wants, maybe narrow the scope of the opinion so other presidents can't just rely on this for anything. Or you're the guy who says, this is outrageous. The president absolutely can't do this. I'm going to tell my colleagues and the president that they go forward with this. I'm going to resign. Now, which of those two people has any chance of ever becoming a Supreme Court justice? <laughs> the answer is not the second one. <laughs> That's... I'm, I'm taking notes because my wife starts at OLC on Monday. So. Uh, she's not going to be that person, probably. There, almost, uh, there haven't been a lot of... The part of people who actually are ambitious in that way usually don't take jobs like that to begin with. Like, I would never take that job for that reason because I... Always want to say what I believe, and that's why I will never be in politics. Uh, well, do I? Uh, but anyway, uh, that said, there is one heroic episode in Supreme Court history. When I tried this, I was actually just discussing this with my students who were very upset when we were discussing Korematsu, which is not a heroic episode. Uh, what, has the Supreme Court ever done something unexpected and almost heroic in challenging federal authority? And the answer is yes. In 1935, at the height of the Great Depression, with great, with still 25% unemployment, with President Roosevelt extremely popular, soon to win uh, the, one of the greatest electoral victories in American history, the Supreme Court not only invalidates the premier New Deal economic Repro recovery program and National Industrial Recovery Act, but does so nine to zero with even the most progressive justices, Cardozo and Brandeis, uh, joining the opinion. Well, that's pretty extraordinary. Uh, for the Supreme Court, cross ideologically, just say, you know, uh, so depression, we don't want, you know, we want to get out of this depression, but we're not going to let this fascistic inspired program as it was, they didn't use that word, but it was inspired by, literally by Italian fascism, where you have unelected bureaucrats who will get to cartelize the economy with big business and big labor deciding prices and wages across the whole economy. We're not going to allow it. And they didn't, and it had good effects, which was, uh, by the time the second New Deal came around, it was much less fascistic, and Congress had gotten its act together to create the Administrative Procedure Act, ensuring there'd be some limits to how much uh, dictatorial authority uh, bureaucrats could encounter. Of course, the court paid for this by Roosevelt after he got reelected, trying to pack the court and thus undermining its authority, and the court hasn't done anything remotely like it since, partly because of what happened afterwards. So I guess the lesson is that we can expect the court to act heroically and stand up to Congress and the president approximately once every 228 years. And the court that does this will actually go down in history as being villainous, as it has in most histories, rather than heroic. Now, I should say, uh, Keith does mention uh, that the court was especially active in reviewing and invalidating congressional legislation in the 1930s. He doesn't mention that there are a few cases that they really uh, he mentions the cases, but they really should have invalidated like the gold clause where the Supreme Court, where the government just relinquished its obligations. Uh, it had contractually agreed to pay people in gold and refused to allow even private parties to get paid in gold. And there are other pretty outrageous cases, but they were. He does point out that um, the court did, in fact, uh, challenge the New Deal much more than it normally challenges things. But I do want to focus on you know, Schechter in particular, just how extraordinary that case was for uh, courts, for the Supreme Court, Republicans and Democrats, uh, progressives and conservatives to all come together in an opinion and tell, and tell an extremely popular president in the height of economic uh, de de deprivation that you can't that your signature program is unconstitutional. So again, very so, uh, not the, so not something we could expect from the court every day, but at least uh, there is that one shining example in Supreme Court history where the court uh, did what the idealistic first year law student might expect them to do. Thank you. All right.
So I'm either the hippest person going here by using a computer, or I didn't get the memo on, on paper. Okay. You're still not using PowerPoint, so, you know. No, which is, no, Which no. is unconstitutional as applied in at least 90% <laughs> of cases. So. Yeah, and I, let me go ahead and, and make the apology for this misuse of the Oxford comma. I don't write the bios, but I'll make sure and, and tell the work-study student when I get back that <laughs> their days are numbered. But, but, but really, where do you stand on uh, how many spaces after a period? You know? uh, well, that's in journalism school, I was taught two. Since then, I've been taught one. But frankly, I'll let people put their spaces where they want. OK, um, anyway, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to be here and to uh, have a chance to read Keith's book and to uh, appear on this panel and talk about it. I think what's really nice about this book is that it is a tremendous resource. It doesn't matter really how you think about the Constitution. It doesn't really matter how you perceive the role of judicial review. Many of the normative questions that we think about a lot aren't really, these are not the things in my view where Keith makes the greatest contribution. It's really asking us to step back and finding this remarkable sweet spot between more traditional legal analysis and then political science analysis. And like David, and I'm a political scientist, uh, I've never been persuaded wholesale by the use of modeling and predictions and numbers. They generally get people where they want to go. You begin with a conclusion that this or that is, that this or that is happening, then you back up, you create a model that unsurprisingly affirms what you set out to do. And you throw a lot of things in the blender, and you never know if they really have merit or not, and then you come to the conclusion that because somebody read comic books when they were seven, because they had to leave religious school at nine and move into public school, they then think the following things for this reason. And that is so broad-based and unhelpful that it really at times is not something that can be taken seriously. So I think the fact that Keith has really delivered this comprehensive book that allows us, no matter where you're coming from, not just in terms of how you think about things, but where you'd like outcomes to be, to be something that's really valuable, not only for people in the academy who, or who work in think tanks, but dare I say it, civilians, who are interested in this kind of work and don't have anything to go to. And I was relieved when I started reading the book and then I went back and read the foreword I was relieved that people like Sandy Levinson had said, gosh, I've never read lots of these cases because I was thinking, God, me either? I mean, literally, this is a gold mine. And it does, as David pointed out, dispel a lot of the conventional wisdom, which, isn't either, which in, in many cases is neither wisdom or necessarily conventional. It just exists because nobody seeks to really challenge it. And Keith has done that, and he's done an excellent job. I agree with him when he says the judicial review of federal statutes reinforces the conditional quality of judicial independence. In some cases, as we know, the court has operated as a partner and an ally of political leaders in some instances, and in other instances, not so much. But I do think there are some clear cases where uh, there is a, and let me back up first. I think Keith's distinction between partisan and ideological motivation and alignment are really important. A lot of it gets lost when people get into battles over how the Supreme Court should decide cases, not methodologically, but what outcome they should reach. And there tends to be this idea that somehow a court that consists of a majority of Republican appointees or Democratic appointees, but the latter hasn't been the case since 1967, and if you think about the amount of work and commentary that has been done lambasting the Supreme Court for carrying out the wishes of this unseen faculty meeting in the Berkeley Law School, it's kind of remarkable to think that there has not been an operating majority of Democratic appointed justices since 1967. And many of the most controversial decisions, whether desegregation cases involving busing, Swan, Roe versus Wade, uh, efforts in the 1980s to maintain, which the court did, a lot of the distance between religion and government when it came to financial aid. If you go back and look at a lot of these cases, they're all decided with Republican-appointed majorities. Take Planned Parenthood versus Casey, for example. The five justices that came together in that case to preserve the core holding of Roe, 
but invalidate three provisions of the Pennsylvania statute at issue were all appointed by Republican presidents. And that threw a lot of people for a loop. And that right there, for me, gets to some of the most interesting questions that methodologically it's very difficult to put your finger on. David mentioned how when justices rise to the Supreme Court, and Keith talks about this as well, they tend to adopt in some cases what we might call a federal view of power, that they might have thought one thing before they got on there, they might have written law review articles or written opinions and dissents if they were serving in lower courts that make you think, aha, when this person gets to the Supreme Court, the wrecking ball is gonna come out. And there might be a dissent or two, but then when presented with an opportunity to revisit and invalidate a very significant precedent, again, whether you agree with that precedent or not, sometimes the justices pull back. Or maybe it's one of a coalition of justices you thought was gonna strike down something very important that pulls back as well. The Obamacare cases are an example, Planned Parenthood is another example, when there were all kinds of predictions that these cases, that these, that these rules were going out the window. And yet, it was Chief Justice Roberts that pulls back in the Obamacare cases, allowing the law to stand. Why did that happen? Well, one can make the argument that he thought about this a little bit more carefully and said, I'm not necessarily sure that this is the right time. Or there are other ways to think about it, but can one make the possible argument that over a lifetime, he didn't want to be associated with invalidating a case that had been heavily criticized as political in nature. Did a certain justice want to be associated with removing Roe versus Wade? Is that something that people want to look back on when the next generation of law students and undergraduates are going to be taught these cases and have that name associated with those particular, division, those particular decisions? That might be the case, it might not be the case, but it's something to me that's very important and it's hard to put your finger on that of how do we go about trying to tease that out and understand how ego and a desire to be remembered factor into how the justices make decisions. So I think uh, Keith really nails this distinction between partisan and ideological motivation. Uh, I think back to, uh, and I, I think it's fairly safe to say that if you are or were a liberal, the Berger and Nixon court did far less damage to the work of the New Deal and the Warren courts that was predicted at the time. Uh, if you read back to some of the commentary of that time, and I was in graduate school for the better part of the 1980s, I can't count the number of articles I read that were predicting the demise of everything the Warren court had done, and that every liberal I knew was either applying for or updating their passport so they could leave on a moment's notice because the world was about to come crashing down. And then when we think about the end of that era, a lot of, them, a lot of the decisions that came under the heaviest criticism from ideological conservatives, and one might argue methodological conservatives, never really came to pass. Why not? It's a very interesting question. And in some cases, the court actually expanded constitutional rights. I think there is, there is some work out there, but it's, it's important to go back and realize that a lot of what the Berger court did was not only to preserve a lot of what the Warren Court did, but to move the law leftward in a number of important areas. Privacy and reproductive choice, school desegregation, it held fast on church and state, it expanded the idea of privacy across different areas. It did a lot, and it also, in 1978, said that affirmative action per se is not unconstitutional. There are limits to how you can use it, but the idea of using race as a remedy is not something that we're gonna throw out the door right now. And that was not the Warren Court that did that. That was the Berger Court. And these were opinions written by, in large part, justices appointed by Republican presidents. So it does raise the issue to me, and Keith gets at this in his book, of how do we understand when the Supreme Court decides institutionally to behave a certain way, either to pull back or to move forward. And I think that's a very uh, important feature of his work. One of the questions I have for Keith, and I hope we'll talk about this in his, uh, and I assume there'll be some follow-up to, to our comments here, is um, Lucas Poe once wrote a book on the Warren Court called The Warren Court and American Politics. So it's pretty clear what that book was about. And a lot of what he argued, and I wasn't necessarily persuaded by that argument, 
is that the court is an extension of the elite governing coalition in power. Uh, I think there is much more to understanding that era, as in all eras, than concluding that there is some kind of common partnership in implementing elite values. The other question I have, not necessarily for Keith, but something more broad, is the phrase elite values is loaded. Um, I would suggest that everyone sitting in this room is an elite in some way by what we do, our level of education, and we're not exactly out there splitting, and we are here, not splitting hairs, but we are discussing the meaning of language and thus the meaning of ideas rather than cracking rocks or working in slaughterhouses. So it suggests when we use the phrase elite values that there is some distant mystical force out there that is forcing uncomfortable values on a citizenry not inclined to share those views. Again, it really depends on what you mean by elite and whether you think things like the right to vote or the right to equal standing before the law or removing impediments to the enfranchisement of persons traditionally disenfranchised are elite values. Concluding that women are in fact entitled by law to administer wills, authorize their husbands to receive employment or insurance benefits, or attend schools once reserved only for men, is that an elite value? Uh, I'm not sure I agree that the Rehnquist and Roberts courts have horrified political activists on the right as much as they have on the left. Um, I don't accept the conventional wisdom that the court is divided between conservatives and liberals. I would describe the conservative justices as having delivered pretty well. I see Roberts as bound by his role as chief. I think he needs to think about the court's institutional reputation now as much as he does pursuing his own ideological objectives. And I would characterize the liberals, and here's where the controversy is gonna come, more as preservationists than either advocating for a dramatically leftward turn in constitutional law or statutory construction. The power just isn't there and it hasn't been there for a long, long time. Anything that the preservationists on the court, the moderate to liberal wing ideologically, but in terms of advancing constitutional objectives, it's been very limited in what it can do, depends on the votes of justices appointed by Republican presidents. If there is no Kennedy, there is no Obergefell. If there is no Roberts, the Obamacare cases come out very differently. There are some small examples of that, but they're important to me, they're important examples nonetheless. To finish up, um, I think Keith's conclusions for a real world understanding of the court and how it operates with the American political system and the theoretical implications for how we, as political scientists, legal academics, and others who think about this stuff are on rock solid ground. There just really isn't much to disagree with here. And in fact, I'm relieved that this is not a book about a search for the sweet spot and how we know the Supreme Court has exercised its power of judicial review responsibly. That is, as Keith points out, a normative debate. And why so many people pretend to continue that there is no relationship between how one thinks about the court and what the Constitution means and how the court should exercise its power to uphold or invalidate laws and what it exactly wants to achieve is really beyond me. The court, as Keith points out, is a political actor. It's a different type of actor, to be sure, but a political actor nonetheless, and for that, we should be thankful and appreciative. The, the final comment I wanna make is, I think, even though Keith's book is about the court and the invalidation of federal statutes, and, and that part of judicial review. I think right now we live in a very interesting time where minority-driven politics drives so much of what we call the democratic values of our country. That in 2018, Democrats received 12 million more votes in the Senate, yet they are hopelessly outnumbered. The president lost the popular vote by almost three million votes. The Republicans have only won the popular vote one time in the last 30 years. Yet, the influence on the Supreme Court, the influence on other institutions is real and palpable. So how does that factor into how we think about the Supreme Court's work? The number of state legislatures that now see this Supreme Court as a place where they can take their concerns, their issues with, with previous law, and the will of the people who vote for them is very pronounced. 
And it's, you know, it's traditional forum shopping. It's like, okay, this court may be hospitable to our claims. Well over half the legislatures in the country are controlled by Republicans and fairly conservative Republicans are like that, especially if we move to the Deep South and parts of the Midwest. How does that, what's the interplay between the dynamic of state legislative politics, minority politics at the federal level, and now how all this drives how we think about the Supreme Court and its relationship to the Constitution, and then how the power of judicial review is exercised. That aside, and that has really less to do with Keith's book as it does just some of the questions he prompted me to think about as I was going through it, I think his conclusion that Congress rarely violates core constitutional principles, but on occasion violates, violates principles that are important or widely held within a political moment is dead on, and it's a great contribution. The comprehensiveness of his book, the sophistication of his analysis, bridging in a very unusual way the best of what the legal academy has to offer and the best of what political scientists have to offer when it comes to thinking about the contribution is, I'm sorry, about the Constitution, is a contribution that deservedly stands on its own. But thank you. Well, Keith, both uh, David and Greg uh, posed some questions, raised some issues I'm sure you want to comment on. Yeah, I would just, um, uh, I guess, uh, echo um, a couple of the, of the uh, points that were made that I, that I think um, um, are important um, politically and, and um, do sort of come out of the lessons of the book um, in part, including um, this notion that um, uh, we should be, uh, I think, uh, not too confident in thinking that the court is going to act in a heroic way um, to salvage a set of constitutional principles um, that we might uh, particularly care about and think are critically important um, in the face of um, an organized um, political opposition that's committed um, to um, policies that the court thinks um, are troubling. The court will often um, back out of the way um, of those majorities. It has um, throughout its history um, ducked in the face of those things, and often the court will come to share um, uh, many of those um, values that we might um, from our own perspective or think are quite troubling. There's just no substitute um, at the end of the day uh, to winning elections, um, building coalitions, um, and uh, gaining support um, in the elected branches. Um, you can't simply count on the courts um, to uh, uh, bail you out uh, when the elected branches uh, misbehave um, or act on uh, principles um, that we think um, are, are outrageous. Um, Courts nonetheless do some useful work, and I hope that the book um, highlights um, some of the ways in which the court has made positive contributions over time. Um, but the anti-federalist writer Brutus um, during the ratification debates uh, warned um, that the courts were likely to be the handmaiden um, to uh, congressional power, that the court would wind up um, uh, building congressional power and opening doors for um, Congress. And I think actually Brutus was right uh, for the most part, that in fact the court has mostly um, spent its time in reviewing um, the constitutionality of acts of Congress um, in helping helping to explain uh, why it is that Congress, in fact, has a great deal of authority, um, certainly enough authority to do the things that it was currently trying to do. Uh, sometimes the court has even urged Congress to go further um, than uh, members of Congress um, are currently uh, tempted um, to do. Um, and that's mostly what we ought to um, expect the court to do, that sometimes it will stand up uh, for some legal values, especially in uh, relatively uncontroversial cases, um, but we shouldn't expect the court um, to be the white knight that's going to uh, protect us uh, when Congress goes uh, completely astray. If I can follow up on that, um, why, why is that, right? Um, if you look uh, historically, uh, I think Institute for Justice did a, did a study of um, Supreme Court and lower courts striking down uh, both federal and state legislation as well as regulations. It's a very comprehensive study. It's from about five years ago or so. Uh, and uh, the number of times that the court uh, strikes down, or I should correct myself, invalidate, and better nomenclature for all sorts of reasons, um, or renders inoperative uh, federal statutes. But it's, it's almost a rounding error, 
Uh, is it because Congress is just perfect and always stays within its limits? Is it because the, the Lucas Poe theory is just an extension of the governing coalition in power and therefore they're not gonna you know, rock the boat? Or uh, others phrase this as the court doesn't get to, despite it supposedly being a counter-majoritarian institution, doesn't get too far ahead or behind a public opinion. And so it's really only the, the very outlying or the most egregious rights violating statutes that get uh, uh, invalidated. Um, so I think it, there's a little bit of all that um, involved. The court, I think, is tethered ultimately um, both to public opinion generally, but also um, to the kinds of um, ideas and interests that animate federal legislation uh, more, more particularly. And so there's certainly um, uh, policies that we would look back on um, and think um, are particularly outrageous or that we think um, obviously um, violate um, the Constitution, um, to borrow uh, from John Marshall as well as the title of the book, that there are laws that in our view uh, uh, we think are clearly repugnant and the court should have um, struck them down, um, but the court often doesn't um, uh, strike them down in part because for the same reasons um, that politicians are willing to vote for those statutes in the first place um, and build them into law is also the case the justices uh, tended to think at the time at least um, that those kinds of uh, policies were uh, acceptable um, and consistent um, uh, with the law. Um, there are occasions, I think, where the justices are more skeptical about what um, uh, Congress um, is doing. They are more skeptical about whether or not Congress is still um, staying within the bounds of the Constitution. Um, and, and sometimes the court will, of course, um, call Congress out on that. Um, but it's also true that when Congress really cares, when they are um, laws that are central um, to what Congress is trying to um, advance, um, the court, I think, has been uh, cautious um, about um, taking Congress on in a, a head-on way. Um, because they're worried about their own um, institutional support and ability to sustain um, the court itself um, over time. So I think there are both um, some strategic reasons for the court to get out of the way, but I think there's also um, some shared affinity and interest between what Congress um, and the court do. Um, it's also worth noting that I think it's also the case that Congress um, is not as egregious as states and localities sometimes are um, about violating uh, federal constitutional strictures. That's not to say that Congress um, is perfect, um, that it never um, uh, passes uh, legislation um, that we think is dubious. There are lots of instances um, in which um, Congress um, does. Um, but it's also true that there are um, examples of kinds of policies that emerge out of the states and localities that the court winds up um, striking down uh, where you just don't see anything quite comparable um, emerging out of Congress um, at the same time. So there are some um, kinds of policies out on the extremes um, uh, where Congress, I think, in general does a, does a better job. It certainly does a better job uh, in the view of the justices. Greg, David, you want to respond to that or further on what? Yeah, I have a question, Keith. I, I just, um, and I, I have, yeah, okay, there we go. Uh, two cases, I mean, you, you, you talk about Citizens United. I'd like to, if you wouldn't mind, just sort of talk about that case. I think that's an interesting example of Congress had sort of reached a point, and then all of a sudden, that, not out of nowhere, but that changes, and then Shelby County. Uh, again, the support for voting rights and the Voting Rights Act had, had fairly wide bipartisan support. And then in 2013, as we know, the court inval invalidates, I didn't want to say struck down, uh, invalidates uh, Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act. So how, how do you help us understand why the court behaved the way it did in both those cases? Because I, I think they're interesting questions, and I'd like to hear how you can help us understand that a little bit better. Yeah, there are obviously um, important cases, um, significant policies, and instances in which the court um, uh, not only was doing something um, uh, legally consequential, but politically um, consequential um, a as well, and runs up against a set, at least, of um, congressional interest um, that were staked to those laws. I don't think it's proper to characterize those laws, uh, for example, as um, clearly antiquated, such that um, uh, no one uh, felt that they uh, mattered um, at the time in which the court um, intervened. That's certainly the case in some kinds of cases uh, where the court is willing to strike things down. I don't think that was the case in, in those instances. Um, but they're both um, instances of statutes in which um, the conservative legal movement as a um, ideological force that's shaping the values of the kind that the justices um, are bringing to the bench um, at that um, particular moment in history um, are skeptical of some of the underlying qualities of those laws. And likewise, 
um, a significant set of uh, conservative um, political activists and Republican politicians um, are skeptical um, of the underlying uh, values and commitments um, uh, uh, of those um, laws, um, and thus um, uh, provide uh, both uh, uh, support and encouragement um, from the court to um, intervene um, in that case. I think the the politics play out somewhat differently in the context of campaign finance as opposed to thinking about um, Shelby County. I think the striking story about campaign finance is the extent to which um, the political left has um, fallen away um, in its um, early support um, of uh, First Amendment protections um, in the context of, of campaign finance. Um, and while it's politically difficult for elected politicians to resist um, uh, the populist interest in uh, regulating um, campaign finance, um, certainly there are lots of very prominent politicians, including um, the Republican uh, president who was unwilling to veto um, the campaign finance bill, but was uh, willing to um, issue a signing statement um, laying out all the constitutional problems um, with the campaign finance bill. Um, I think the courts um, saw an opportunity um, to step up to the plate um, in that context and enforce a set of rules and values um, that they had um, been committed to um, and the politicians uh, were not always as consistently um, committed to. Um, Shelby County, I think, is a somewhat different and interesting um, story as well from that perspective. Uh, it's worth highlighting the extent to which the court um, uh, did not um, uh, take a broadside against the Voting Rights um, Act, but is rather um, cutting at a, a particularly innovative um, uh, feature of the Voting Rights Act that um, was important, um, but also um, conceptually quite controversial in thinking about um, how the Constitution uh, works, leaves a lot of the Voting Rights Act um, still in place, and leaves a lot of room for Congress um, to adjust and respond if there's actually enough political support um, to adjust and respond. And that's often true of how um, the court um, issues its rulings in invalidating statutes, that even when it um, uh, limits the uh, scope of a particular um, policy or statute, um, it gives room for Congress to respond and adjust and often um, continue to advance that same policy goal um, through a somewhat uh, modified um, statute. There's not always the political support um, to uh, generate those new statutes, and I think that's the situation we're in now, where there's um, so much division um, in Congress itself, it'd be very hard um, to build the coalition that would be necessary to advance um, those policies again, but the court has left space uh, for a new um, coalition in the future to, to do that. If, if I can put a finer point on, on what Keith just said, because I've written quite a bit about both of these cases, it seems like both rulings were uh, were compromises of the sort that I think all of you talked about, you know, with Roberts putting something together. Not, you know, it's not like the court struck down all of campaign finance laws. It was almost a redux of Buckley versus Vallejo, you know, rewriting the campaign finance laws that Congress passed into, you know, keeping some, not keeping another, kind of, you know, one of those opinions where it takes a paragraph to explain which justice uh, joined which part of which opinion and, and all of that, uh, you know, building on, on McConnell versus, versus FEC. Um, and, and Shelby County, uh, you know, Congress, if, if Congress had only updated the coverage formula in 2006, which was uh, a proposal that was, that was ultimately shot down, I don't think the court would have struck it down. There was only one vote, uh, Justice Thomas, to agree with, with my position, with Cato's position, that Section 5 in modern times, uh, the preclearance regime is simply, can, can no longer be justified however you update the formula. I think if Congress had simply uh, had, as to, to, to quote uh, Chief Justice Roberts, have, uh, who was in turn quoting the, the 60s court, have uh, uh, current burdens meet uh, uh, current problems, then, uh, then it would have sailed through. But the fact that the Congress just effectively treated the, the landscape as not having changed since the 60s really made it tough for the court and pushed Roberts, who in both of these areas, Campaign Finance and Shelby County, had been incrementalist, right, because there had been uh, Namudno, a couple other cases on voting rights before then, uh, it, it, it kind of put him into a corner and said, well, you know, I've given you the opportunity, Congress. You haven't responded. I, I'm going to have to do this narrow ruling to, to correct you. David, I wanted to ask you, um, since you're the only law professor uh, on the panel, uh, what does this, what does Keith's work add that you don't see from, you know, your colleagues in the, in the legal professoriate? Uh, and uh, how is it, uh, you know, does it, is there any, anything from this approach that strikes you as particularly refreshing or odd, helpful, unhelpful to the sorts of work that, that you do in, in analyzing constitutional law? That's a good question. I mean, I think I, you know, I tend to write about constitutional history, so I read a lot of historians. I admire Keith's work and Ken Kirsch and a bunch of other people. Some may not be uh, <laughs> the best 
uh, person to ask because I'm sort of immersed in you know, Sandy Levinson and you know, Mark Raber, a lot of political scientists who I personally uh, find their work uh, appealing. So uh, and maybe that's true of you know, constitutional law scholars in general. Uh, so it may not be as much of a divide, there's certainly more of a, less of a divide now than there may have been 20, 30 years ago. That said, what I think is good is that when you read some of the political science literature on the Supreme Court, it's so reductionist. So let's, you know, oh, the Republicans appointed these guys and the Democrats wanted this policy and the Republicans got appointed, so of course they in, uh, invalidated it and so forth and so on. And it really neglects the political context, the moral context, the justices. I mean, I think one thing that we law professors tend to think a lot about, which political scientists other than Keith uh, maybe don't, don't think about, is that people that, you know, lawyers uh, as, and ju ju justices have um, a sense of what is their role in the world. It's not, and they don't think their role in the world is to enforce whatever the political coalition that put them in power. It doesn't mean they don't always, as someone that naturally, uh, if you're gonna work your way up the Republican or Democratic ladder to get to the point where you're eligible to, a Supreme, to be a Supreme Court justice, you're going to share a lot of the values and assumptions of your social political class, but that's very different from the idea that this is what they think they're doing. And because they don't think they're doing it, it means that they don't feel obligated to do it, which means if they really do think that this is contrary to the Constitution or their uh, responsibilities as justices, they won't do it. Uh, I don't think Keith actually falls into that trap. I'm, I'm actually kind of curious. I, I, I think that this book will be well received uh, and probably has been already uh, by other law professors. I'm wondering actually whether political scientists think it gets too much into things outside the formulas that they have accepted as what the Supreme Court's really doing. Yeah. Have they? <laughs> I mean, I think there's some risk of that, right? I mean, the political scientists have their own approach to thinking about these things, and, and this book falls within um, uh, one literature in political science, but um, I don't think it runs headlong necessarily against um, um, other approaches where, as, uh, of how people try to think about digital politics. It doesn't um, pursue the same kind of uh, statistical and analytical um, orientation to the court as uh, some of my colleagues in the discipline um, would. Um, uh, and I think some of the, therefore, some of the conclusions um, uh, might uh, uh, be surprising um, to them from their own orientation. But I think ultimately the book is hopefully complementary to both the kinds of findings that um, political scientists from a range of research traditions um, have come to in thinking about the court, um, but also the way historians and, and law professors from their own disciplinary perspectives um, come to the court um, as, as well. I think the details uh, may, oft, may often be surprising, but I don't know if it's a, a frontal challenge to um, uh, particular schools of thought. Instead, I think part of what I uh, try to display in my own work and what I would encourage others to do more generally is to try to synthesize this stuff more so that we can find more of a common uh, ground between uh, the way scholars from different disciplines approach these things and, and um, are less likely to be uh, reductionist um, in thinking about um, how judges behave as well as other um, political actors um, behave more generally. That it, you can learn something um, by thinking about judges as if they were politicians, um, but I think you lose a lot um, too, um, and you have to keep your eye on the fact that they are also um, lawyers and judges, and, and that matters to their behavior and the kinds of um, outcomes that emerge in courts. I do, I do think also that um, when I started law school, say in 1988, there was still a sense in the law professor oriet that there was, this, there was something of a heroic view of, judge, of the Supreme Court rising out of Brown and the Warren Court that I think has been chipped away to a large extent by historians and political scientists. You know, Brown didn't actually do all that much until Congress stepped in. And uh, the Supreme Court really, and by the way, by the time Brown came out, a majority of American public opinion was against school segregation. So it wasn't as counter-majoritarian as you think. So I think also for that reason, there's less of a distance uh, than there might have been in the past that would have been considered maybe outrageous 30 years ago to say, well, you know, the court are not really heroes. They're just political actors who can move the ball maybe a little bit further or 
move the ball back a little bit, but aren't going to make drastic changes. Uh, there was a whole generation of constitutional law professors who thought they were entering the field in the early 70s because they were going to establish a right to a minimum income and create racial justice and all these things. And I've heard some of them talking, you know, at conferences, you know, that how disappointing their lives have been <laughs> because they they became a law professor in 1971 and there hasn't been a liberal court to do what they want. Now, the interesting thing will be if the liberals ever do get control of the court anymore, whether uh, suddenly the heroic version will uh, recur, not so much because people believe it, but because they want to persuade the justices, right? A lot of, uh, uh, too many of my law professor colleagues uh, are pretty much, un uh, I don't know if they realize how transparent it is, but really shift the way they talk about the court. You know, well now we want, oh, minimalism is in. Why is minimalism in? It's not because these people have become minimalists, it's because they want the conservatives to do minimal things. So I'm very curious to see whether this literature would stick if uh, in a future Sanders administration with a majority of uh, left-wing justices, or whether it's, uh, whether the political science-y historical a uh, more subtle version of the court has only become popular among law professors because it makes them feel both feel relief that the uh, current court isn't going to do that much damage, but it also allows them to tell the court, you're not really supposed to do that much damage. Well, the history and political science tells you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, open the floor for, for questions. Um, please wait to be called on. Uh, wait for the microphone so everyone both in the room, but even more importantly, uh, in our uh, online viewing audience, they can't hear you at all if you don't have a, uh, a microphone. Uh, and announce your name and affiliation, if any. So, questions. Also, ask an actual question right there. <laughs> <laughs> these are these are questions, not statements from the floor. Yeah. <laughs> it is a little bit more of a pushback perhaps than a question, um, but I do want to hear a response. Um, so we'll call a question <laughs> for that. Um, it was more to, to Dr. Ivers in that uh -oh. he was poo-pooing elite values as a way to describe what the court was doing. And I thought in his own examples, he had a very good example where um, the court would was reacting to something other than, you know, popular opinion, but opinion within the circles which the court ran. And that was when he was talking about not wanting to be the court known as the court that overturned Roe. That seemed like something that would be very unpopular within what I would call, you know, the elite, but within the public might be heroic, or at least within enough of the public to be something that would be uh, something that people would do. And then actually, I don't know enough to say, another example came up during the discussion when they were talking about campaign finance reform in something where I myself might be more sympathetic, but where it was that the public would view um, uh, campaign finance reform as something not to be overturned, but where the elite was like, no, 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 you gotta go somewhere. So that seemed to be, you know, I'm, I'm not sure why you were poo-pooing elite values, because there seemed to be, and there could probably be more if I was more of an expert, if you guys had talked more, where I could say, you know, here's something where the elite was, you know, one direction, and the court went that direction, and the public was not there. Oh, well, first, um, in fairness to myself, I wasn't poo-pooing elite values. My comment was, what are elite values? Okay, that means that all of the people in this room are an elite of some sort by our education. I'm just a simple yeah. constitutional lawyer. So. <laughs> yeah, okay. Country constitutional lawyer. Nice try. Uh, that we're all elite. I mean, by, by where we went to school, the level of our education, and again, the fact that we're sitting here having this discussion and none of us are out cracking rocks and slaughtering animals and doing that kind of hard, hard work in the fields. I think there's a tendency in political science scholarship, and I can speak to that more than legal scholarship, to take, to set up, and I hate to use this word because it drives me crazy, but to set up straw men and then dismantle the straw man when maybe that wasn't the straw man to begin with. For example, when, when people talk about Brown, I find it enormously frustrating that assessment of whether that decision was, quote, effective or not, 
whether it had significance or not is limited to at what rate Southern schools desegregated within a certain period of time after that case was decided. Brown was a lot more than that. Brown was, Brown had been building for almost 20 years. There were lots of other things going on there. There was a whole grassroots movement that had not yet gone above ground to change the constitutional landscape of the South and the political landscape of the South. It's almost as short-sighted as when people say, well, the reason the Voting Rights Act was enacted in August of 1965 is because John Lewis was beaten up at Selma. That ignores the guerrilla warfare that organizations like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, the Congress of Racial Equality, and other actors have been laying the groundwork for that in places like Mississippi, uh, where less than 3% of black citizens were registered to vote in 1960. In Alabama, in 1960, on that famous weekend in 1965, 156 of Selma's approximately 15,000 black residents were registered to vote. So paving the way for a voter registration campaign was a long time in the making. And so when we get to a point where we say dismantling state-imposed racial segregation was somehow a northern elite value coming out of the white world doesn't even come close to me to what that decision did. There was not a lot, but I grew up in Atlanta in the 1960s and 70s, so part of me is looking at this through the experience of the real world. There was a lot more discomfort with elements of racial segregation in the South than in many places in the North, and people were afraid to say so. Obviously, the tax on African-American citizens to speak up, to agree to be plaintiffs, to challenge longstanding practices was consequential to a point where, as we know, you could lose your job, your livelihood, your home, and even your life. What incentive was that to do? So when the NAACP begins Brown, Brown was a lot more than just about reforming the school system. It was the first real shot at the constitutional architecture of white supremacy in this country in which a mainstream white institution, the Supreme Court, sided with minorities and explicitly African-Americans. So whether that decision was gonna be self-executing or not, the president at that time did not support Brown. If you go back and look at his address after Little Rock, he's not talking about the moral implications of this. He's reminding people we look really silly in, in front of the rest of the world, specifically the Soviets, and we need to stop this nonsense and understand that we're losing the propaganda war. It created an environment for people to become more active. It's like not including the, the murder of Emmett Till as a significant point in the civil rights movement. If you only look at cases and statutes for what they did at that particular time, you're not gonna capture everything. So I think the idea of what elite values are really is a question of definition. It's, it's not poo-pooing anything at all. I mean, I consider myself a fairly regular person, but am, am I an elite based on what I do, uh, how, what I get paid to do, where I live, and all of that? Certainly. So I, I think, in other words, and the last thing I'll say is that when you think about things like campaign finance reform, I don't think the great mass of Americans is thinking too much about that. It depends on where that gets them. If it gets them the politicians they want, they might be for it. If it doesn't get them the politicians they want, then they might be against it. And I think what's also interesting is to think about how all these decisions don't just happen. They're a product and sometimes of decades of litigation. The conservative legal movement had been redefining what the First Amendment meant on its side uh, all throughout the 80s and 90s and into the aughts, just as the liberal legal movement had been redefining what the Constitution meant in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And it began to mean things uh, very different than it meant in a previous generation. And that came through sustained litigation. It came in other areas of the First Amendment by thinking about religious practices, not as religious practices, but denials of individual free speech. That's a paradigm shift and how you think about the First Amendment. Nobody was thinking about the right of a student to pray. It was, may the government impose this on students and then make them pray. And 25 or 30 years later, it's a question about the freedom of a student to express his or herself in the public school. And by limiting what that student can say, are you violating the student's First Amendment rights? So we shifted from government to looking at it from the vantage point of the individual. I suppose that's what I was trying to say.
uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Jim do on no affiliation. This is a little off topic, but I note that one of the handouts is by Mr. Bernstein about whether the Constitution says anything about impeachment proceedings. Uh, one issue there seems to be whether uh, President Trump has a constitutional basis to refuse to cooperate with the inquiry. And it strikes me there may be two bases. One is that he's it's the sole repository of executive power. He can direct the actions of all members of the executive branch. And second, under his power to, um, to, to, to enforce uh, uh, the, the Constitution, uh, his, his oath to defend and support the Constitution, he can take the position that an improper or unjustified attempt to decapitate the executive branch uh, violates or, or is an attempt to, to, uh, um, to violate the Constitution. And I wonder if Mr. Bernstein and anyone else on the panel may have uh, a view of any oh, either it, of those it, two it justifications. Is off topic, but, but I'll allow it because I'm curious <laughs> what David has to say about it. Uh, I'll, I'll make it really quick so we get more on topic. I think the president has the absolute authority to refuse to cooperate with anything he wants to refuse to cooperate with, and Congress has the right to then make that one of the articles of impeachment and see where it goes from there. Yeah, I would, I would echo the same. I've been writing a fair amount about impeachment stuff lately, particularly at um, Lawfare and other places, but, and uh, I'm absolutely with David on this. I think the president certainly has some authority to uh, want to resist these um, inquiries. Um, he certainly uh, can complain about the nature of the process um, that Congress is pursuing, but Congress has a, a lot of discretionary authority about how exactly it wants to pursue the impeachment process, and ultimately Congress can, review, can view presidential obstruction um, of the impeachment process as itself an impeachable offense and use its own power um, to push back on a White House in, in this regard. Right there. Ar Article 1, um, Section 1 of the Constitution says all legislative power shall be in the Congress. Where does the court get the authority? We can say, you know, sort of assumed to strike down law. Or is it to rewrite laws? Take the example of the uh, Affordable Care Act where they, they struck down the portion about uh, if you uh, don't uh, agree to uh, put into Medicare 125% that uh, they just rewrote that and said, well, that's up to the states because it, to do otherwise be, in Roberts' words, economic dragooning. Uh, did you have many examples of where they actually re rewrite statutes? Don't just strike them down? And, and say, you know, Congress, you decide how to rewrite the law? Yeah, I think, of course, uh, judges would resist uh, the description of what they're doing as uh, rewriting the law, and, and they recognize there's um, real limitations as to what their authority um, is in that regard. Um, on the other hand, I think um, engaging that kind of process is exactly how the court often um, tries to enforce constitutional boundaries um, against Congress. It sometimes will simply say uh, a particular pr uh, provision of a statute is null and void and can't be um, applied under any circumstances. Um, that too, of course, across American history has often been very controversial as well as to where judges get um, the authority to declare um, pieces of legislation um, uh, null and void. But in addition, um, the courts will often um, say um, that the way this provision is written, um, it seems to encroach on some set of constitutional limits or it seems to exceed um, uh, congressional constitutional authority um, in some ways. And as a consequence, we need to read into it um, exceptions, qualifications, restrictions that have the consequence that the law can't be applied in the case in front of them um, and also in other cases um, as well. Um, how expansively um, they do that in particular cases and what exactly that looks like is going to vary quite a bit. So sometimes that can be, that can look pretty modest in how they're doing it. Um, but that's definitely part of their toolkit. Um, and, and, and part of the toolkit that they've used over time 
And in lots of points in American history, they thought that was the less controversial thing they could be doing. So instead of saying um, Congress has um, uh, exceeded constitutional boundaries here and as a consequence their statutes void, um, they thought it was a more modest thing to say, um, let me just tell you where the limits are and we'll pull back the statute a little ways um, so it doesn't bump up against those limits as much, but we'll leave the statute itself um, in place. Um, but of course, on a case-by-case -case basis, sometimes that too um, is gonna seem like a very controversial move. Is that hand in the middle? Hello, uh, Michael Webb, uh, Arlington, Virginia. Kind of building on the journalism kind of metaphor, to what degree does uh, editorial discretion play a role in the ability to, uh, of the Supreme Court to kind of decide on these questions? Uh, the decision of a lower court to uh, unpublish the decision or not to put a lot of dicta in or, or something like that. To what degree does that uh, play a role? So I think the justices have a lot of flexibility about how they approach um, individual cases, and and that's varied over time as to what that flexibility um, uh, winds up um, looking like, um, and, and and this plays out in variety in a variety of ways. So. Um, uh, for example, it, may, it matters what the lower courts are doing as to whether or not a lower court, for example, is explicitly striking down a federal statute that can um, uh, force the uh, Supreme Court's hand a bit in trying to intervene in a case like that, uh, whereas if the lower court claims that's not what they're doing, they're doing something more modest, they're, re they're reinterpreting a statute to avoid constitutional limits, for example, it makes it a little easier for the U.S. Supreme Court to um, avoid having to immediately uh, weigh in um, in those um, kinds of situations. Um, and so I think the posture by which the case is going to get up to the courts um, can uh, uh, and move through the judicial hierarchy um, can matter um, for those purposes. Um, the court's own internal practices can make a difference in this regard. So through much of its history until the early 20th century, the Supreme Court had um, so-called mandatory jurisdiction that people could make appeals um, directly to the Supreme Court and under a variety of conditions, the court had to accept um, those cases and hear them. Um, but the practice for the court um, through much of the 19th century was to um, allow in those, uh, precisely in those cases, a, a lot of flexibility to the attorneys as to what kinds of arguments they wanted to present to the justices. Um, and so famously, Daniel Webster might go on for three days with an oral argument um, before the justices um, in a, a particular case. And as a consequence, those lawyers are throwing all kinds of things up against the wall to see what sticks. Um, and the justices then often are picking and choosing which of those arguments um, they're actually going to spend any time on in their opinions and which ones they're just going to ignore. Um, and so there's lots of instances, I think, as well, where litigants would like the justices to think about the Constitution and think about constitutional limitations. Um, and the justices instead simply ignore that that's an issue that's been raised, and instead focus their attention um, on statutory issues or other issues in the case that allows them to resolve it without having um, to deal with the constitutional issue. Uh, now, when they have discretionary um, jurisdiction, they have even more flexibility to um, uh, do that, um, of try to focus um, the uh, uh, not only how the opinion's written, but also the cases that they hear um, in order to focus attention um, on the kinds of issues they actually want to grapple with. Um, so the justices, I think, all through history have been quite creative um, in how they want to approach cases, and there are um, some limits on their creativity. They're sort of imposed by how those cases arrive um, at the court. Um, and among those limits is um, uh, whether or not there's a pipeline to even get cases there in the first place. And so one reason why the justice spent lots of time dealing with tax cases and other kinds of cases um, uh, earlier in American history is because there were people who had a financial investment um, in those cases and they wanted them resolved. And so they were pushing those cases forward. One thing that changes in the 20th century is the rise of the ACLU and the NAACP and other um, organizations um, like that, um, that were pushing a whole wider range of cases um, up to the court and as a consequence, raising a whole different set of issues and policies for the justices um, uh, to deal with. And so um, there's a lot of things that, that feed into the process Process by which um, the court is ultimately trying to articulate constitutional limits. Um, and the justices have control over some of that, um, but they don't have control over all of it. I was wondering, Keith, uh, relatedly, two big changes in Supreme Court jurisdiction. The first, 
well, federal court jurisdiction. There was no federal question jurisdiction until 1871, I think it was. Yeah. So most cases are coming up from the state courts, even when they raised federal issues. And the second, you just mentioned discretionary cert, which not only gets, let, lets the court decide which case to take, but reduces its docket from, you know, by two thirds or three quarters. So I'm wondering if, I don't know if you thought about this when you were writing the book, but whether those changes uh, or maybe, you know, maybe the court was more likely to be active when state courts, state courts are probably going to be less sympathetic to federal issues, so maybe if they're hearing the cases, there's more room for the court to rein them in, and also it would seem to me that the court would be more likely to fully invalidate a law rather than just nip at the edges when it has more time and energy to think about the case and its implications than when it's hearing 800 cases a year. But I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's probably an element of that. Certainly they write longer opinions um, as, a, as a consequence of having fewer cases to hear. I don't know if that necessarily means that they're um, uh, bolder, more ambitious about how they um, deal with those cases. One thing that, of course, happened with the court um, un until they had a, discre a large discretionary docket was that um, they heard a lot of easy cases. And so not only were there a very large number of cases, but there were a large number of cases in which they thought the, answer, the legal answers were actually pretty easy um, and obvious and, and presumably, therefore, did not take that much time uh, for them to produce opinions on it, but also meant in this specific context of, of how the court is um, thinking about constitutional challenges to legislation, it meant during that period as well, they were hearing lots of cases in which they thought the constitutional answers were easy on those cases. So a chunk of those cases where the court is upholding um, federal policies against um, uh, constitutional challenges um, are instances in which the justices dedicate two or three sentences uh, to explaining why, of course, Congress has the authority um, uh, to do this before moving on to other issues um, that the case uh, might uh, might raise. Um, one thing that's, that's striking and interesting to me is the extent to which um, after the court has, has uh, adopted a discretionary docket and has a lot more choice about what cases to take, um, they still wind up taking lots of cases in which they're upholding um, statutes against constitutional challenges, um, often because they're trying to explain to lower courts, including state courts, um, um, as to what the right constitutional answer is here. Um, and the right constitutional answer from the justice perspective is often um, that Congress has the power to do things. Um, and, and they take those cases in, um, sometimes precisely because they need to instruct um, uh, other judges um, that that's true and encourage those judges to uh, get out of the way. Keith, what's the takeaway that you want to leave folks who are thinking about our debate about the proper role of a judge, activism versus restraint, the advent of this judicial engagement which gets attacked as being judicial supremacy? Uh, you know, someone who reads your book to try to get, uh, you know, access to, to, to those kind of questions. Um, so I think in part that the, the, the uh, world of constitutional law looks a lot more complicated um, um, if you uh, step back a bit and take a perspective across um, the range of how the court has used this power over time. Um, the court seems uh, much less reliable um, than you might hope. Um, really, I think regardless of what your perspective is on the correct way of interpreting the Constitution, how you understand the constitutional rules, um, I don't think anyone is going to look at the court's entire record um, and think, yes, this exactly aligns with my own particular vision um, of how the Constitution ought to be uh, interpreted. And so I think that should encourage us to have um, uh, some modesty about what exactly we can expect out of the court and some modesty about... Um, uh, how useful our own particular interpretive approaches are going to be in actually guiding judicial behavior over time. Um, I certainly have my own preferences about how the court ought to interpret the Constitution. I've spent time writing about how I think the Constitution ought to be um, interpreted. Um, but I think as a descriptive matter, um, the court doesn't always align uh, with those things. And so if you uh, really care about constitutional rules and constitutional values, um, you should care about the court, but you should also care a lot um, about elections and elected uh, politicians because uh, uh, who's um, in those offices uh, will matter tremendously. Um, as to what our effective constitution actually looks like. Great. Well, I think we'll end on that note. Let's give a round of applause to the panelists.